That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts, and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Friends, as you're able, would you stand as we sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing? Samuel, way back in the Old Testament, it's in the second chapter. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. His mother used to make for him a little robe and made it for him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli will bless, would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, may the Lord repay you with children of by this woman for the gift that she made to the Lord. And then they would return to their home. And the Lord took note of Hannah. She conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. 
Now, Eli was very old. Wait a minute, I might have gone too far. <laughs> I did. All right, and I'll end it this way. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Friends, this morning we'll affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. As you're able, would you please stand? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father. Christmas, we're going to sing Joy to the World. You can remain seated as we sing. Gracious God, we join together today, the day after Christmas, to give thanks for the birth of a little baby that came into a chaotic, politically divided, angry world. And in the growing up and living that he did, he began to show us what grace, what love, and what mercy really looked like. People that were from foreign lands, he greeted them. People that didn't worship God the way he did, he greeted them too and even saved them from their diseases. So today we come asking that same Jesus to heal our friends and to heal us. Of course, we want physical healing, but we also need spiritual renewal. To be reminded that once again, Christ comes into the world and to ask the question, what difference will it make? 
And we know that as we begin to follow him, it makes all the difference because it makes an eternal difference. We pray for those that don't know Jesus. We pray for those that don't live like they know Jesus. And we pray for each of us that we would be restored in our faith, revived in our practice, and then to be inspired to go out into the world to take the light of Christ into the same world that's still politically divided, that still has chaos all around, and show that the light of Christ can change everything. It's the gracious love of Jesus that gets us to follow Him. It's His teachings that show us how to live. And it's even the prayer He prayed that teaches us to pray when He said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, we're going to sing again. Go tell it on the mountain. And we're supposed to be talking about Jesus everywhere we go. We're going to sing about him right now. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father 
through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That's a profound statement, isn't it? And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. You read that again. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Giving thanks to God the Father through Him. I can't think of a more convicting part of the passage of, of any word. Everything. Everything. Drive to work. Drive through the traffic. Answer the phone. Buy groceries. It doesn't say all that in there, but it says everything, right? Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, we have a song we sing around Christmas. You know, Santa Claus is watching. He knows if you've been naughty or nice. You've all sung that, right? Well, Jesus knows even more than Santa. Not only does he know when you've been sleeping, when you've been waking, he knows what you're thinking and how you think. Everything, even your thoughts, need to be in the name of the Lord Jesus. You want to fix the problems in our world today? I believe that'll do it. If we just start doing everything we do in the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, when we're uh, prepared to be angry, well, that may not be easy to do in the name of the Lord Jesus. Maybe sometimes the things we're angry about aren't worth being angry about at all. Sometimes, maybe, the things we think are so important are really not all that important at all if you put that little caveat at the end that I have to do this in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, I really like that new 2021 car, but do I need to buy it? Because can I honestly say I need it in the name of the Lord Jesus? Probably not. We live in a world right now where we have all of us, all of us have more than we need. Maybe not as much as we want. And it's sometimes it's an eye-opening experience to look around the rest of the world and see that even those of us that are the poorest are wealthy according to worldwide standards. And yet we probably whine and gripe louder than anybody else. I remember when we were in Costa Rica uh, we learned a lot about their customs. In Costa Rica, you live at home until you're married. And so sometimes dad was pretty anxious for the boys and girls to find a significant other and get out of the house. But they were incredibly happy in spite of having so much less than we had. In fact, they were really joyful. And it was a different world, right? We go down to Walmart or H-E-B or Kroger and we can buy anything we want. They had little stores on every corner. One sold bare bread, one sold something else, another one sold meat, another one sold vegetables. So they had to be communal. They would go around and they get to know other people in their neighborhood. When I first moved to Deer Park back in 1983, Gerland's was the main store on Center Street. And... Uh, if you, there was really nowhere else viable to shop. I mean, there was another couple of grocery stores, but everybody went to Gerland's. And, and uh, if you were active in the Deer Park community and you went to Gerland's, you were going to see somebody you knew. And it was kind of humorous once I became a preacher because I'd be in line behind somebody and they would have, you know, some wine and beer and stuff in their shopping cart. And then they look around to see me in the shop. So oh, we're, we're having a party. <laughs> you know? I said, you don't need to be accountable to me. You know, uh, there have been days past. I put plenty of wine and beer in my shopping cart. That's not, uh, that's not the sin. But I think we sometimes uh, forget how communal God wants us to be and what it means to be, that what the scripture says, to be accountable to each other. So we should, we do that, right? When we're hurting, when things are wrong, we, we, we're happy to get on uh, Facebook or whatever and say, would you pray for me? I'm hurting. Pray for mom. We, and we, by the way, we're praying for your mom, Kelly. Uh, you know, pray for moms and dads and brothers and sisters. And we want to do that. And, and sometimes we even get on there and say, praise God, things went okay. 
But seldom do I see a prayer on there that says, God, help me become more like you. Help me become more forgiving. Help me be less judgmental. And that's the thing we all struggle with, right? I mean, we all struggle with being judgmental. I mean, if you don't, I'd like to talk to you because I, I can be judgmental. You know, I can think other people, hey, I'm having a hard time adjusting to some things that are happening in, the, in, in this century. I don't know about y'all. You know, things look different. Uh, the commercials on TV sometimes are irritating. I'm just not sure what's happening to the world around me. It's leaving me behind. Well, I do have a smartphone. I'm not totally left behind. Some people still have flip phones. <laughs> I got this great Christmas present that says, uh, just be careful what you say around the pastor. You could end up in a sermon. Well, yep, it just happened. <laughs> it happens. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I think as I read this scripture and I was thinking about it because uh, the everything is what bothers me. I'm okay with having God involved in my godly activities. But I'm not okay with God being involved in my ungodly thoughts. And probably God's not going to change, so it means I need to work on my own ungodly thoughts. As I prepared today to have some kind of a message for us on the, the last day, the last time we'll worship this year, it occurred to me that this is the 14th time that I've stood in front of this church to have a Christmas sermon of sorts. 14 years. And, and really, this place doesn't look the same as it did 14 years ago. But neither does the community. Uh, we had a lot of saints here that have gone on to be with God. They know more about God than we ever do now. And it's a long list. I was laughingly telling stories about Jewel McCauley early, earlier because there were some funny stories. Uh, of course, we had Bill Massey and Doug Larson and Mary Larson and Myrtle Brownfield. And my gosh, there's just been lots of people that have gone on to be with God. And I guess we can take a certain amount of pride in the fact that we were like the launching pad, right? We were, we were the place that they were coming when they went. But to have a church that fulfills this scripture means we've got to take a serious look at everything we do because we want to make darn sure everything we do is in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that's a tough call because sometimes there's a, there's a pressure from the world to become something else so that you can have more people in the chairs. There's a pressure to have something else so that we can have a more dynamic place Sometimes there's a pressure to change pastors in churches simply because they don't like the way it's going. But as we take a look at 2022, the needs of this community in 2022 are not the same as the needs of this community were in 2008. So if the community's changing, and we're going to continue to provide for the community, and we're going to do that in the name of the Lord Jesus, then we need to take a long and serious look at where we're headed and what we do to make sure we fulfill that prophecy, that we fulfill that scripture. And I want to tell you that's not easy. I do believe that, that some of the things we're doing make it more economical for us and, you know, if you save a dollar here, you can spend a dollar there. There was a young man in church with us Christmas Eve that uh, we were talking uh, about stuff like that. And then I, I had the, the occasion to spend a, a whole afternoon with a friend of mine on Thursday that regularly doesn't go to church. And uh, I told him, I said, you know, my perfect, and, and then yesterday my ex-brother-in-law, we were having the same conversation. My perfect thought of what, a church would be doing if they were fulfilling this passage. We, whatever dollar we spend on ourselves, we would equally spend a dollar on somebody else. Now, we haven't ever quite accomplished that. But I think it can be done. Now, 
everything counts, right? Time, treasure, and talent. So a lot of people are bringing food for the food pantry. That counts. I mean, that's what we're doing. We're feeding people in the neighborhood. And so there's not a, you know, there's not a dollar bill attached to that, but that, that counts. What are we doing for others? What are we doing to make sure that ministries like Bill Nash's ministry succeed and thrive and continue to help children that we couldn't help any other way? How do we get those young couples that we have come to church now and again, how do we get them involved in such ways that we once again have a, a strong and growing children's program, but we can't just say, oh, we're going to have one. We've got to provide something, but we can't provide it if we don't have the people. And so we've got to encourage those people to come. I, I got news for you. You know, we can... If you go hire a youth director, and that doesn't fix the problem. You go hire a young preacher, and that doesn't get a younger audience. It's got to be us that decide we want to make things happen. And so when they when they come and they visit, we've got to make sure that they don't just visit once or come once a month. We've got to find a way to get them to come in more often. And i got to tell you, sometimes that's just to let them know you care. The, uh, the Grand Master of Masons from Texas, I had a occasion to visit with him. And just like every other organization, the Rotary, the Kiwanis, anything that you join, the, the attendance is down. Doesn't matter what it is. People, millennials don't join stuff. They just don't. And so, you know, there's always this deal. Everybody says, well, how do we get somebody we haven't seen in a long time to come back? And I, as a realist, I want to tell you, it's really easier to get a new person than it is to go and get an old disgruntled person to come back. It's just easier. Because you sometimes just can't fix hurt feelings. But what he said, I thought, rang so true, but, and I've learned this from experience. You know, when we run in, when we bump into somebody that we used to see in church a lot, we don't see them anymore, instead of saying, oh, we miss you in church, which I believe creates a guilt trip, maybe it would just be better if we would just say, hey, it is so good to see you. Maybe once in a while we need to pick up the phone and call instead of saying, hey, we miss you at church. When are you coming back? We ought to pick up the phone and say, hey, I was thinking about you. Just want to know we love you. Maybe fellowship comes from something else other than guilt. And maybe we don't realize when we're increasing guilt for people. <coughs> but I can tell you as a person that skipped church plenty of times in my life, I felt bad enough about it. I didn't need you to remind me. And you know what? Sometimes you find out. There's a reason they weren't here. Sometimes you find out that mama's been sick or so-and-so's been out of town or somebody's having to travel to work. And then we have a whole new thing to reach out to and find out. I think of Buddy and Sue and Jeffrey. and I think, you know, this is one of those times that if you got a phone and you got time, this would be a great time to reach out and just say, hey, y'all okay? You know, I told Sue, I said, anything you need, call me. She said, I know. And maybe she will, but my guess is she won't. And so that means we got to call back. And we got to keep calling. We got to chase the people out there that need to be loved, like Jesus is right now chasing you. And I think that's what this scripture leads us to when it says these, these really interesting things. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has already forgiven you. Above all, clothe yourselves with love. Because love binds things together. And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called into the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your heart, sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Sing them to God. Wesley had something to say about singing. Maybe you've never thought of it this way, but the people of God are people of singing. They've always sung. Moses and Miriam sang following the Exodus. God is the recipient of those songs, yet God is also the one who provides and motivates the singing. The Wesleys acknowledge the trained God is both the source of inspiration and the subject for thousands of hymns. Hymn singing was and has always been a part of our Methodist worship, whether with family and small groups or congregations. Hymns convey our adoration, our thanksgiving, our gratitude to God. 
Hymns allow us to express to God over our, over our own condition the depth of our longing, our petitions, our prayers, our joys, our triumphs, our lamentations, and our sorrow. Hymns and the exercise of singing can bring about, cultivate, and increase the necessary Christian virtues of faith, hope, and love. Charles Wesley wrote about 6,000 hymns. We don't have all 6,000 in our hymnal. It was said, I've been, to, I've been to Charles Wesley's house in Bristol. It was a, a six-story house, but it wasn't very wide. So like on the bottom, of the basement was the kitchen, the next floor was the living room, and then the bedrooms were stacked out above. And Charles had an office on the top floor. It was a little bitty. So I saw the smallest fireplace I'd ever seen. It was about this wide, about this big. They burnt coal in it. And it was said that Charles would come running into the house, run up six flights of stairs and go to the top and write a hymn because he was inspired. It's also been said that if you just sang all of the verses of John Wesley and Charles Wesley's hymns, you would get a theological education second to none. In any Charles Wesley hymn, you start off as a sinner and you end up in heaven. And so the reason that we dwell so much on that is I know sometimes you think, will this song ever end? Pay attention to the words. Really, we're supposed to be learning and feeling. How many of you have learned stuff from popular songs? If I were to say right now, I'm standing on the corner in Winslow, Arizona. Anybody know where you heard that? You? Not on Facebook. No, on your Facebook. Well, it's a song. Surely you know the Eagles song. It's the Eagles. Yeah, it's the Eagles song. So you learn stuff you don't even know you're learning, right? And so we're on we're on Arizona. Kathy says we got to go to the corner in Winslow, Arizona. Apparently, we're not the first ones there. They have a shrine. <laughs> but the hymns are the same way. I, one of these hymns, I can't remember which one we sang on Christmas Eve, but it says uh, thither. I, I just always wonder what a thither is. You know, maybe we should just study the words of the hymns. There's another one that says, he's my Ebenezer. And, and people I know are out there, what in the world is an Ebenezer? It's a stone, it's a rock that you measure yourself against. The hymns have educational qualities in them and they're part of our worship. And it's the reason we still sing them. And it's the reason some people just really don't like contemporary worship because so many times the contemporary songs don't include all of the stuff. Although when Chris is here and when Francisco's here, our songs have a nice mix of hymns and other songs. And sometimes they get improved. Chris Tomlin took, you know, Amazing Grace. I know all y'all love them. But everybody loves Amazing Grace. Probably everybody but me. I'm just singing a lot in my life. And, and so Amazing Grace, he added a chorus to it. And the chorus says, my chains are gone. I've been set free. Isn't that powerful? My chains are gone. I've been set free. And of course, when Charles and John wrote the hymns, they didn't have, they didn't write music. They only wrote words. And so they needed to figure out a way to get people to sing the songs. So they went down to the bar down the street, found the songs everybody was singing, and they put words with it. So everybody knew the tune. They didn't need a hymnal. They knew the tune. And they just put the new words with the old tune. We can still do that today. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It goes with Gilligan's Island. Right? I was going to say, it does. <laughs> It's still a pretty uplifting song, isn't it? Blind, but now I see. It also goes with the, the uh, How's the Rising Sun too. Uh, if JT was here, he could sing it for you. I can't. But I, I think the whole notion is it's not the tune. It's not even always the words. It's going back to the scripture about are we doing everything we do, not just in worship on Sunday or Saturday or Christmas Eve or Easter Sunday. Are we, doing, are we living our lives giving glory to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? 
Now, you shouldn't feel bad if you haven't mastered that because in a few weeks we'll be reading the scripture where Jesus is in the temple, right? Remember? Mom and dad are looking for him and they can't find him and they go back and they find him with the religious folk in the temple. Y'all know that story. And mama says, why are you here? And he said, where else would I be? And then the scriptures tell us he left that place and grew physically and spiritually. Now, most of us don't need to grow too much more physically. <laughs> but we can deal with some spiritual growth, can't we? And so my goal as we enter 2022 is let's become a fellowship of people that are growing spiritually to be more spiritual, closer to Jesus, more like Jesus tomorrow than we are today. And I think if we could just keep this little phrase in our head... And we can keep it in there in the mornings when we get up and look in the mirror or in the afternoons when we're tired or ready for a nap. If we can just say, and whatever you do in word and deed, do everything in the normal name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, our Father, through Him. I'm just silly enough to believe if we make that our deal, if we do that every day, if we remember that it's the real thing that makes the real thing the real thing, right? If we can just focus on that, I believe we can be a part of healing and changing this troubled world. Will you join me in working on doing that? There's not a test. I'm not going to ask you if you had a good week or a bad week. But Jesus knows. He's given everything. Everything for you. What will we do for Him? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, there's a lot of, we have a lot of kind of modern songs in our hymnal, but this is like my favorite. This is just so everybody can sing this. Friends, as we close our service today, remember the offering baskets in the back. We're not passing the offering yet, uh, but we are inviting you to stand. If today be the day you would unite with our church, come forward now as we sing. Let's sing this great. Let there be peace on earth and let it be in. Let there be peace on earth, a peace that was present with God our Creator. Children, all are we. Let us walk with each other. Jesus that unites us together and friends it will be the presence of the Holy Spirit that gets us through. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.